Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around the World on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii and Wananui Kea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. The title of today's episode is United Ukraine, We Can Win the World We Want, Beauty and Bravery Beat Barbarity. Joining me today is Tara from the US AID Human Rights in Action Program, Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union. Tara, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. We really appreciate you spending time, especially in this most tumultuous circumstances. Could you tell us where you were on February 24th? Um, yeah, I could share my story because on the 21st of February, I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. It was around uh, 5 a.m. because uh, the blasts uh, could be heard outside. And uh, at first I thought that uh, it was uh, not something real, but still I tried to look up uh, Facebook uh, news outlets and just to call my friends. And it was apparently a start of uh, an overt full-fledged war uh, led by the Russian Federation. And uh, to some extent, it was not a surprise, of course, because uh, the war was going on starting from the 2014, but it was a bit different war, non-conventional war, where Russian Federation took over uh, the Crimea, which is uh, part of the Ukrainian territory. And afterwards, it uh, waged war against Ukraine via its proxies and denied its presence on the ground. Thus, taking into account all the circumstances, it uh, was not a surprise, but still uh, it meant that you had to make uh, very fast decisions because uh, I had to take care of my family, of course, uh, my wife and two kids. And that's why we had only like um, two hours uh, at our disposal in order to bring all the uh, things together and to uh, take our kids and uh, we instantly drove to Lviv. This is the western part of the of Ukraine. It's around 500 kilometers uh, from Kiev, from capital, where I worked for the last three years for the Ukrainian Health and Human Rights Union. And it took us around uh, 23 hours drive, which is usually around seven to eight hours. Uh, this is due to many queues on the roads and of course the checkpoints which were installed on the ground, but still it was uh, something uh, for us uh, when we came home and we uh, felt a bit secure, but uh, I was very disappointed uh, when a lot of people could not uh, uh, drive their way from Kyiv and were stuck uh, the days which uh, came uh, after after it and of course the overall situation around ukraine deteriorated drastically and uh, no one feels secure in the western part of ukraine where we currently are located since uh, on the 24th of uh, february uh, russian federation uh, launched rockets on our military infrastructure of course they were not in all cases precise uh, rockets and they had a very collateral damage inflicted on uh, civilians as well but now as we all see we have gone too far from this uh, so-called military operation which is officially uh, named by the russian federation uh, of course we see many acts barbarous acts on the side of russian federation regrettably but on the other side we cannot have no more illusions what is a real Russian Federation, uh, because it is bellicose country, it's revanchist country, and it lives with the history, because everything it can offer to its neighbors or to its own population is history. And in these terms, uh, there is no future in Russia, because the future is the past, and the past is the future. No, it's a great point. And thank you for sharing your harrowing story to make sure that your family is safe. And it's not only that, definitely freedom for the entire world is at stake, and also the existence of the state of Ukraine and self-determination for all countries. I think the concept of interbeing, of understanding that nothing exists separately from anything else, and we're all interconnected, 
is what is really striving as we're supporting and there's more and more solidarity for Ukraine right now. We know you desire to be a rights respecting democracy and not a satellite state, as you pointed out. And it's really important, of course, as we all know, that truth is not a luxury, it's a right. So thank you for sharing with us today what has been going on. Can you share a little bit about what the Ukrainian, what your NGO does and, and how that's important even in today's time, even more so probably? Um, yeah, I um, joined the Ukrainian Health and Human Rights Union um, about three years ago before I had a uh, pure ac ac academic profile. I was doing a lot of research in the field of international law. But after the Orange Revolution, especially uh, after 2014, I was firmly determined to do something more for the Ukrainian people, something which could not be done within uh, the uh, with, with with the students, uh, although it is also a very important topic to tackle. And that's why I made a decision to change drastically my professional affiliation. And I was very lucky to be a part of the team of the Ukrainian Health and Human Rights Union, which is presumed to be one of the biggest NGOs. It's like an umbrella NGO and comprises a number of uh, smaller NGOs. And um, as previously mentioned, uh, it is the implementing partner of the USAID project, which was launched in 2014. Basically, it addresses issues of human rights violations in terms of the ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine, in Eastern part, uh, and also in Crimea. So in a sense, I just switched my academic background to more practically oriented things. And to this end, we produce a lot of analytical reports in order to disseminate all the human rights abuses which are taking place within the uh, armed conflict in Ukraine. We do advocacy events. We also push for harder sanctions to be imposed on Russian Federation. We also litigate cases uh, domestically and even internationally in order to have some impact. And last but not the least, uh, we try to be as much as resilient within the country uh, to, 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 as much as we can. No, that, that sounds so important, especially when we look at what's going on. There's been more than 2 million Ukrainian civilians fleeing the country, half of those, at least 1 million children. And of course, the World Health Organization verified attacks on health centers in Ukraine since the start of the invasion, and have also been documenting. And as you talked about your international advocacy, I think that's really important because you see that people really recognizing the national flag that's been there since 1848 evoking that field of wheat beneath a clear blue sky of freedom, people are really standing up. And that's what's been so important. One of your examples that inspired me, got me to think about the Human Rights Council. And on March 1st, when the Russian foreign minister was about to deliver his message to the Human Rights Council, an entire contingent of more than 100 diplomats walked out of the Human, Council, Human Rights Council for the first time to say, they would not listen to such a message because it's exactly as you were saying, it is definitely an act of war. It is definitely causing horrible pain and killing. And what's really important is that it's been a pivotal moment though for the world and for the council that they're not ignoring reality and they're looking at their obligations seriously under the UN charter, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and standing up saying no more. The other part that was quite exciting was how more than 2,778 new sanctions have been designated and slapped on since February 22nd. And now there's more than 5,530. And the other side also is just everyday people. In a 48 hour period, 1.9 million uh, in Airbnb booking fees were paid, but guests aren't checking into the Hotel Kiev because as you described it, everyone had to flee due to really the crimes of aggression that Russia has been contemplating. Could you maybe share how people are holding up more? I know that really the bravery and the beauty of people standing together in solidarity has inspired people to do more than they have done at the UN. It's in fact, what's happening inside Ukraine is really creating a ripple effect of rights around the world for countries to do more and for international institutions, as well as really OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, 
is really where the Helsinki name comes from with that basket of human rights. Can you maybe share how everything is still going one week, 12 days into the conflict? Mm, yeah, uh, if I may, I will just take a step back in order to emphasize one important point uh, in my view. So the stakes are not just about Ukraine. The stakes are about um, the legacy which was crafted af after the World War II, namely the uh, rule-based order. And this is uh, what is important. You cannot just redraw borders with the use of force. You cannot just change history as it was before the World War II. And uh, this is totally unacceptable, uh, such a line of thinking. And that's why Ukraine aligns its, itself with uh, a lot of universal uh, international organizations which uh, support uh, international legal norms. And that's why we have unprecedented support, which was mentioned by you at different uh, levels, not just the UN, but also we may look into some other fora. For example, International Criminal Court uh, has agreed to open the investigation into the war crimes and crimes against humanity, which occurred on the territory of Ukraine. So before it was just a preliminary examination, but this is not the case uh, now because a lot of countries, around 40 countries, they turned to the International Criminal Court in order to speed up the investigation. And so we have some early implications that uh, there will be more progress. And even the delegation of the International Criminal Court uh, is on the ground investigating all these atrocities committed by the Russian Federation. And I would just uh, like to emphasize again that uh, this is not a war which is waged in line with the international humanitarian law, where is the distinction between the military objectives and civilian populations. So what we are witnessing is a blatant violations of international humanitarian law whereby Russian uh, military, they are intentionally targeting civil and in, ci civilian infrastructure. They are shelling ambulances, hospitals, schools. It has no justification at all. And what is more uh, striking that the uh, military operation, uh, according to the words uh, and statements of Mr. Putin, he said that uh, the genocide is occurring on the territory of Ukraine. And this is a pure gaslighting on the side of Russian Federation. And this is always how it looks like because the only truth uh, which is pursued by Russian Federation is very one-sided, but it is very, uh, it is at odds with the facts on the ground. It, everything can be verified by the bipartisan reports of numerous international organizations. And Ukraine generally is a, a diverse country, multinational country. And actually, uh, Putin has not learned lessons after 2014 at all. He miscalculated about Ukrainian society that you cannot impose any political will on Ukrainian nation. And this is mostly important. And now we see the, uh, how people are united. Actually, this is the continuation of the Maidan revolution of 2014, because a lot of people had horizontal connections. They volunteered a lot. They donated as much as they can. So this is a horizontal society with critical thinking and um, I would say some value based and everything which was uh, deemed uh, by Russian Federation as a problem here, for example, culture, uh, language, religion, it was disregarded by these people. And uh, what is more, last but not the least, that uh, it is uh, Putin who did his best to unite all the Ukrainian people against him. And even Russian speaking Ukrainians who reside in this country, they take up their arms in order to defend their motherland and to defend their freedom of Ukraine, self-determination of Ukraine, and so on and so forth. And this is basically how it is working now. And uh, 
I, I, I am admiring not only Ukrainian people, I also value a lot as many Ukrainians the support which is coming around the globe to Ukraine and especially from the United States and their allies in Europe and um, taking into, into account the latest statement from Mr. Biden, uh, who imposed a ban on oil gas and any energy supplies to the United States and actually the United Kingdom will follow the suit and some other countries will allegedly do the same uh, afterwards. So we see that the political, diplomatic and legal dimension are tightening the grip and Russian Federation is in the full isolation, it becomes a sort of paria and this is uh, what should be done, of course, and I think that the support, uh, it, it is uh, the strongest we could ever expect it, and even Mr. Putin thought that he would uh, get a much, not such a robust response from the West and, uh, and from the US, but still, uh, we need drastically, as you all might know, uh, the non-fly zone over Ukraine. This is a very complicated issue. I. It, uh, I accept, uh, but still we need more pressure. And even according to the polls uh, throughout the U United States, they show that people and citizens of the United States uh, vastly uh, support a non-fly non zone. And actually we have a number of examples in history when non-fly zone was introduced. So we would very welcome the next step or some more stronger uh, armor supplies to Ukraine, uh, um, I mean some jets, uh, which is also a question on agenda currently now. And everything the rest will be done by our brave army, that's for sure. And we are, as I mentioned, are not only protecting our country, but also the legacy of the World War II. No, thank you. It really did bring up that spirit of San Francisco, the UN Charter, and Putin's actions were a flagrant breach of the most fundamental rules of interstate relations and that UN charter to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its member states. That's probably why, as you pointed out, even after Russia blocked a vote in the Security Council with its veto, 141 countries voted on March 2nd to support Ukrainian sovereign rights, denouncing clear violation of the UN charter international law, with only four countries voting with Russia and the other 35 abstaining. What really is important now though is, is also to see what was being done as you brought up the International Criminal Court. It is true that 39 countries referred the matter. And if you do look at what was going on, Russia's military invasion meets the definition of quote, an act of aggression as defined by the ICCC. And now we note that President Putin could be personally respond, prosecuted for the crimes. I believe Article 8.1 bis, Article 8 bis 1 defines a crime of aggression as the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in position effectively to exercise control over to direct the political or military action of a state of an act of aggression, which by its character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the charter of the UN. And that means Putin can be personally responsible. And what I think is another point that's so important to build on what you said, since the crime of aggression has no statutory limits, along with the three other international crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, Putin will be legally accountable for his actions against Ukraine as long as he lives. So these are some of the points building on which you raise the political, the legal, and also the moral aspects of his actions has really united people to stand up for what Zelensky is talking about of, we are all Ukraine because no one would ever want their country to be invaded. And that if we lose this rule of law, then of course we lose everything that was gained by people coming together to say never again. And there's more that we must do. Uh, I would just like to intervene shortly. Uh, there are some complications with regard to persecution of Mr. Putin okay. with regard to the crime of an, an aggression and uh, the expert community is well aware of that but this does not regard the war crimes and crimes against humanity and this is what actually is taking place currently and that's why alternatively uh, there is a suggestion and an ongoing discussion that a special tribunal should be established in order to pro persecute uh, personally Mr. Putin for 
was the crime of an aggression uh, in, in Ukraine. So this is what we are anticipating. And this is uh, already being discussed very seriously within the expert community and supposedly will be pushed forward. It's very important. And it, it, it echoes really what people are trying to say. I believe Maldives had one of the best explanations on their vote. They said, as a small state, they've always taken a principled stand on violations of territorial integrity of a sovereign country. And they said the position is based on a bedrock belief in the equality of all states and unconditional respect for the principles of the UN Charter. And of course, what's really important is if we're trying to move towards peace for everyone, they say, we know we do not possess powerful weapons of destruction. Instead, we rely on our principles and the solidarity of nations. That's really what Maldives is saying, but that's also what Ukraine is saying, that we want to move away from war and we want to make sure that the international system works so that people do not have to resort to the situation that Ukraine finds itself with an aggressive neighbor. Uh, sure, we, we do not need uh, another uh, high cost to pay in order to invent something else. I think that uh, the international system, existing one, has not exhausted its uh, resources as such. And afterwards, I think we have to reconsider the world we are living in, because the uh, current situation is not just the, uh, the matter of this year because uh, all the previous military campaigns and adventurism of Mr. Putin personally elsewhere was like rewarding him for uh, his uh, military adventures. Every concessions, for example, his intervention and incursion in uh, um, Georgia, for example, in 2008, uh, also did not bring about any uh, any breakthrough in this respect. Their troops are uh, on the ground still. They did not pull out their, uh, their, their troops. And there is uh, one uh, uh, funny thing uh, about Russian peacekeepers. Uh, I, I, I would just, to, I would like to voice it that Russian peacekeepers are keepers of Russian empire. They come, but they never go. Very true. And that, unfortunately, is the pattern that we've seen in your homeland since 2014. And there wasn't as strong of a response then. What has also been interesting is what you alluded to earlier, also the people inside Russia rising up, the people with peaceful protest. And I'll never forget the woman who's roughly probably 80 years old with a simple sign just for peace and being arrested. And that, I think, shows the weakness of Russia right now. And if you also look at its most recent laws, you and I appearing today probably violated those recent laws about the media because Russia enacted laws that criminalize independent war reporting and anti-war protests with penalties of up to 15 years in prison. And that of course is the wrong direction of where we're at and what's going on. So those are of course important to show how people are standing up and what we can do going forward. Uh, I think this is a big drama for modern Russia because uh, a lot of people who are residing in Russian Federation are not even aware uh, to the fullest extent, extent what is really going on in Ukraine because uh, a lot of communications with our counterparts which are living in Russian Federations, they are refuted and they are just saying that this is all fakes, that only nationalists in Ukraine are uh, intentionally shelling all this civ civilian uh, infrastructure and so on and so forth. And that's why Russian Federation uh, has uh, an obligation to denazify uh, Ukraine. But this is uh, ridiculous because uh, any facts on the ground uh, just support uh, this point of view. There are no Nazis in Ukraine. This is something like from the history taken out by the Russian Federation and uh, which is easily accepted in Russia. And this is uh, a big issue actually, because uh, Russian population is brainwashed, has been brainwashed actually within years and they cannot accept any other um, points of view and the diversity of views is actually suppressed severely, as you mentioned. And of course, with your leader being Jewish, that of course even points out more absurd of how it is. What, what is really important and what I hope we talk about also and why we have to keep discussing this is we really see a person violating international law, international 
criminal law, also international human rights law. And if you look at the practice that has happened to so many cities in Ukraine, where you surround a city, then you cut off the electricity in the middle of winter. And I remember the winters there can be quite chilly and then cutting off the water and then continuously shelling. This is just blatant acts of violations of international law against civilian population. Uh, yes, and I would just like to uh, conclude uh, your remarks. Yes, this is very appalling and disgusting by all means. And actually today, six year old uh, girl, she died uh, because uh, of the de dehydration. She was blocked in the city of Mariupol, which is located in the south of, of Ukraine, and it's surrounded by the uh, Russian troops. And uh, Russian Federation actually depicts itself as a um, salvation army who comes here in order to save Ukrainian people from our authorities. And it by all means uh, denies it's even uh, uh, this statement because they are not raising Ukrainian cities as such, not just shelling Ukrainian infrastructure. They are also demolishing uh, churches, which are Russian Orthodox churches. No, I, d I have heard as well that uh, a lot of statues and cultural artifacts are being wrapped in bubble wrapped and trying to be moved to be preserved because it's that rich heritage that people do not want to lose, even though the sad thing is the actions still keep coming and there is fear that it would get even more dastardly in the upcoming days. Uh, of course, uh, we can expect more barbarous acts on the sides of Russian Federation because it has very huge losses on the ground. And this uh, looks like a retaliation to civilians on the side of Russian Federation because it cannot gain what it planned. It uh, was presumed to be a blitzkrieg according to the plans of the Russian Federation. They plan to invade Ukraine within three days, but this is a total miscalculation of Mr. Putin. No, and it's important as we get into the final moments, even the hacking collective, Anonymous, declared a cyber war on Vladimir Putin and his allies, and they, have using with their 7.6 million followers, are also standing up. So we just want to thank you for standing up for human rights and international order that is rooted in the rule of law, and we want you to still be safe, and we look forward to continuing our conversation and thank you so much for your bravery that then inspires the world to do more as well. And to also remind us what matters most. Uh, as long as we stay united, we stay stronger and we will win. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.